Awesome videos. Hi, I'm Dave and Bringram in Dr. Resnick's video reporting class, and I'm here today to talk to you about a day that I love to celebrate and one that I'm sure you love to, too. You haven't guessed yet? Well, it's a day about love, romance, cards, courageous, a note, flowers and roses. And I'm, of course, talking about Valentine's Day. But hey, what are we waiting for? Let's do this. Valentine's Day, Valentine's Day. Valentine's Day has a special place in all of our hearts. Whether you're in a relationship, single, lonely, angry, homeless, balding, <laughs> or popular, everyone looks forward to an awesome Valentine's Day. Before we go any further, let's take a look back at the history of Valentine's Day. History of Valentine's Day. Valentine's Day first started in 500 AD in Europe. The History of Valentine's Day. Love is in the air this Valentine's Day. Everyone has twinkles in his eye. This city is going to paint the town red and pink. I'm here today with local florist owner, Mike Rabinowitz. Mike, tell us how you're going to take Valentine's Day and make it special for someone. Well, we at Dr. Flower love Valentine's Day and we, and we love to cater to the college student. And, and so we've got all kinds of deals and packages for the Happy Valentine's Day. Oh, hi. And now it's time for Damon's The Four L's of Valentine's Day Dates. Four L's? Laugh. Like the person you're with. Elaborate. But don't take my words for it. Four L's? See for yourself. Wow. Valentine's Day is almost here and I already have goose pimples. I hope you have a great Valentine's Day, whether you're out with your sweetheart or you get pizza and stay home and cry yourself to sleep. Thanks for joining me on this Valentine's Day journey. It's been an amazing trip. I hope to see you on my next video. For now, I'm David Bringram, signing, signing off. off. We're glad that you're all with us this morning. Would you stand and worship with us? This world can be cold and bitter. Feels like we're in the dead of winter. Waiting on something better. But am I really gonna hide forever?
fan the flame and make it grow. So there's no doubt or denying. Let it burn so brightly that everyone around can see that it's you, that it's you that we need. Start a fire in my soul, fan the flame and make it grow. Deep the wound is no matter 
just smile and say right here, right now, I'm okay because the cross was enough. I cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled snowing again. <laughs> Why are you guys happy about that? <laughs> yeah, that's fair. That's fair. I did use the hate word last week, and I still hate the snow. Uh, hey, so uh, this morning, in honor of the greatest sport 
ever. I almost wore my hockey jersey, um, and uh, but I didn't. Yeah, that's that's true. It is. Uh, I'm, it's okay. Matt didn't know, so I'm gonna push that back over. It's my fault, not his. So we just have a few announcements this morning. It is Super Bowl Sunday. That's super exciting. Uh, and I, so I asked through Julie, actually Julie suggested this, this happen. And I said, that's fantastic idea because I don't follow football, y'all. And so she's like, hey, John Moeller does this really great Super Bowl sermon. And she's like, I almost, I almost want to go over there and hear him say it, do it. And so we talked a little bit, and I, I said, I won't be mad if you want to go. And she's like, well, what if he comes here? And I said, that's a fantastic idea. So he's here, and I'm excited because I would have botched a football sermon horribly, and I was going to try. So I'm really glad he saved my, saved my life today. So John Moeller's here. He's going to speak with us this morning. I got a chance to... to Get to know John a little bit when, when COVID hit and we, we did the shutdown and everything. Dr. McCain uh, wrote a series of, he's writing a series of books called Multiply NAS. And he got some of, his, uh, some of us pastors together in a cohort to force us, no, I mean to give us the opportunity to learn the materials in his book. And uh, uh, John and I were in uh, the same cohort together over Zoom. So we got a little bit of a chance to get to know each other and... Uh, I appreciate John's heart, and I'm really excited that he's here this morning. It is Alabaster month, all month, February and September. The Alabaster chest is up here. Thank you, Rose. If you have any extra change, dollars, if you want to write a check, we take this uh, offering every year a couple times. It's separate from your tithes and offerings, and it helps the global Nazarene mission build churches and uh, hospitals and schools and all that good stuff all across the globe, particularly in countries that might not otherwise have the funds. So this is a really great way for our local church to help in that arena. So any Sunday this month, you can drop it off right here, and we would appreciate it, and the whole world would appreciate it. Man Camp, I will mention that again, Phil is super excited to have you go to man camp. So if you consider yourself a man, um, you should probably go. I may not be going. What does that say about me? I was waiting for somebody else to say it. I wasn't going to throw myself under the bus. Uh, I will let you form your own conclusions, but uh, hockey is still better than football. Um, <laughs> Super Bowl party tonight, though, and I will be there. Uh, 5 p.m. tonight, Super Bowl party. Um, we're going to clear these chairs after church, put the tables out, bring snacks. Because if you don't bring snacks, there will be no food. And if I show up and there's no food, I'm, I might shed a tear. And then you can judge my masculinity at that point. Bologna salad sandwiches, thank you. And veggie tray, perfect. That's what Julie's bringing. So if you, you can either match or, or top that, and we'll be in good shape. So Super Bowl party tonight at 5. We'll have the game on all of our screens. It'll be fun. Uh, super start for the little kids. Well, I say little kids. They're kids. Four, fourth grade to sixth grade. Thank you. Um, we've got a few kids from here going. The uh, sign up was by today, I believe. So you do still have a 12 hour period where <laughs> if you decide you want to go, let me know and we'll make it happen. Um, but we do have a few kids already signed up and we're ready to go to that next month. That's super exciting. So I'm going to stop there. If I forgot anything, uh, you can, you can stone me later. Um, but I'm really excited to have Pastor John here. Let's say a word of prayer real quick, and I'll invite him up. Father, thank you so much for, for bringing us all together here this morning. Um, 
thank you so much for, for this, this weather, the snow, even though you know how I feel about it. Father, thank you for, for the hearts in this room, the souls in this room. And uh, I just pray that you'll be with us. You'll prepare our hearts and our minds for the message that you have for us this morning. And I pray that you'll be with Pastor John and be with his, his message this morning and, and prepare his heart to deliver your word. Thank you so much again, Father, uh, for just allowing us this opportunity. In Jesus' name, amen. Pastor John Moeller. And don't forget to turn your little switch on. Thank you for allowing me to come this morning and to preach the good news to you. This might be a uh, completely different sermon or message that you've ever heard, and I think a word of explanation is in order. It is a, it is a sermon. You will hear, in my opinion, the good news of what God has done and is doing today in the world and in the lives of people. Uh, but I use a sports theme. Uh, to, to do that. Uh, this started roughly around the year 2006. I'm not exactly sure. Um, I am a true believer in what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, when Paul says, to the weak, I became weak. He says, I've become all things to all people, so that by all possible uh, means, I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel, that I may share in his blessings. Those, uh, those verses in my personal experiences have shaped my ministry, my philosophy of ministry. I grew up in a non-denominational white country church across from a cemetery with a creek running by and an outhouse in the back for the bathroom and a coal and wood burning stove along the side. No, it wasn't in the 18th century, uh, but that's how it was. And I remember being a child and later a teenager in church, and a lot of things that went on, including in worship, just didn't connect with me. And as a pastor, and especially when we had our kids in church, I always wanted to try to be able to connect with everyone, including the children and the youth who were there. That has always been a, a drive for me as, as a pastor. And so I had heard of other pastors doing a Super Bowl sermon. I've heard of churches closing down services on Super Bowl Sunday and all kinds of things. And I, one year, uh, when our kids were still home, I thought, I'm going to try this. I'm going to try a sermon that's going to be different than anybody's ever heard. I understand some may not appreciate it, may not be their thing, but my goal was it would connect with somebody. And so I did it one year, and I saw some of the faces in the back. I could tell some weren't quite, quite getting into it, but I saw some faces, and they were listening. And so I thought, okay, you know, I did it. That's good. And then next year came around, and our daughter asked me, Dad, what are you preaching on Super Bowl Sunday? And I said, I hadn't planned on doing it this year. She goes, oh, I actually listened to that sermon. So... I did it the next year, and I've done it almost every year ever since then. And I try to have a little fun with it. Again, I try to get people to listen and have a little fun. We can have fun being Christians, can't we? I mean, we can. We really can. You know, we don't have to be all somber and, and serious-faced all the time. Uh, God wants us to have life and life abundantly. That means we have a good time worshiping and living for Him. And so I try to do that in, in this sermon. I try to have a little fun with it myself personally, and hopefully some of you will have a little fun or enjoyment in it too. Uh, towards the end of the message, I will reveal who I'm rooting for. Uh, Louise has asked me several times. In fact, she, earlier she said, how about telling us at 938? And I said, towards the end. And during the message, you might think, oh, okay, he's rooting for this team. Oh, I don't know, maybe this team. And that's part of the, the plot. But uh, the Super Bowl sermon is basically a tale of two teams, two franchises, and I delve a little bit into the history of them because, again, I love history. I love sports, especially basketball. Sorry, Adam, basketball is the best sport. Uh, uh, just kidding. Uh, but that's where my heart is. I love basketball growing up in Indiana. Um, but um, 
I try to convey all of this uh, in, in a way. Um, football, Super Bowl Sunday, we use this. I use a little bit of the history. Again, I enjoy history a lot. And I think history is important. I know it bores a lot of people. But history will help us understand where we are today, how we got here. You know, we just didn't jump into a transporter and suddenly, bam, we're at the Paxton Church and the Nazarene on February the 13th in 2022. Uh, didn't happen that way. You know, we've got here on our journey, both in our, in our life as well as our spiritual journey, a step at a time. And the things that have happened to us through the years have made us who we are today whether it be individually or as a church, as a family. And so I, I get into history. I think it's important. In the history of these two teams, the Rams and the Bengals, they kind of differ a little bit in their history. And in fact, with the Rams, the Rams started back in 1936. And no, Louise, I was not alive in 1936. Uh, this is pick on Louise Day. Um, but they started not in Los Angeles, but where, Louise? And I do this a lot of times, too. I, I enjoy participation. Louise, remember what I told you? Am I really putting you on the spot too much? Either, Violet, do you remember? No, didn't start in St. Louis. They moved there. Cleveland, Ohio. Cleveland, Ohio. Yes, the Rams started in 1936 in Cleveland, Ohio, in one of these earlier football leagues. And they didn't have a lot of success at all, really. Uh, and then they got word about roughly 10 years later that a new franchise in another league was going to be coming to Cleveland. And that franchise, the, the main person was a coach, a very popular college coach by the name of Paul Brown. Anybody remember Paul Brown? And he was a famous coach at Ohio State University, and he was going to be the coach of this new franchise coming to Cleveland. And so the ownership of the Rams decided it would be almost like a death blow to try to compete against this new team with popular Paul Brown. And so they moved out west to L.A., and that's how they got out to, to be at L.A. But if you follow the Rams through the years, you know they, for a while they moved to St. Louis, which was crazy, and then they moved back to L.A., um, and in fact, you know, in our life, you know, there are a lot of connecting points or intersection points in our life, uh, places and times where we intersect with a person, we meet them. It may be a very short meeting, very short intersection, but again, thinking about the history, those points of interest, uh, intersection, commonality actually play an important part. And, and the, here where it comes into play, both the Rams and the Bengals. Their histories kind of intersect a little bit. Because when Paul Brown went to Cleveland, and this new team was going to be called the Cleveland Browns, uh, after him, and from the very beginning in 1946, they were very, very successful. They won the NFL championship the very, four, the very first four years of their existence. And in fact, in the, they, were, they played, I, I, I didn't double check this, but what I found out in my research, they actually were in the NFL championship game for the first 10 years of their existence, winning seven of the 10. They were extremely successful. A lot of people say it was because of Paul Brown. And the team was sold a couple times, and back in 1961, I think it was, something like that, uh, a guy by the name of Art Modell from New York bought the Browns. He was an advertising executive, he was much younger than Brown, and he connected with the players, but not so much with Paul Brown. And a rift began between the owner and Paul Brown. So much that finally, in a couple years, he fired Paul Brown. And uh, for the first time in many years, Brown was out of football. He was living a life of leisure. He had made enough money that he could do. He played a lot of golf. But he was getting, if you were really involved in sports, you get the itch. And he got the itch to coach again. And then he got word that another new football league, known as the American Football League, or the AFL, was going to have a franchise come to Cincinnati, Ohio. And Paul Brown wanted to be a part of it, but he did not want a repeat of what happened in Cleveland. 
So he became a majority owner of the team. He became the team's representative to all league meetings. He was the front man for the team, the general manager of the team, and the head coach of the team. Well, while the team in Cleveland retained the name the Browns that bore his name, uh, he was the main man for the new team called the Cincinnati Bengals, who then later merged with the NFL. And so Paul Brown, you know, actually was that intersecting point, you might say, between the Rams and the Bengals. And he himself had a very uh, large part in the founding of two present-day NFL teams, the Cleveland Browns and the Cincinnati Bengals. And his legacy continues uh, with the Bengals. In fact, the stadium that they play in is called Paul Brown Stadium. And his son is now the current owner and general manager as well. So they had that commonality, that intersecting point. When Paul Brown was fired you know, from Cleveland, even though he had been extremely successful, you know, he had no idea what was coming down the road. But what was coming down the road was this new opportunity. And that's how often life is when we have these intersecting points with people or incidents in our lives. And sometimes these incidents may not seem to be very pleasant. Sometimes, you know, if we're honest, we may even ask God, God, why, why did this happen? You know, in fact, you know, maybe sometimes you even may have said, God, this isn't fair. This just isn't fair. Why did this happen to me? or to my child, or to whoever you know, we may care for. But we don't know God's plan. God has a plan for every life, and He doesn't reveal it to us all at once. It's step by step. And I'm not saying God causes bad things to happen to us. I don't say that. But sometimes He allows things to happen, even if He doesn't allow them to happen, but He does because He's all-powerful. He uses those experiences. Again, to form us and to transform us into something and someone that he can use. Amen? And I tell you, that's, that's how it is as a Christian. He uses things and people to change us. There's, in the Bible, a very good example of that is Joseph. Remember Joseph in the book of Genesis? Joseph was one, at that point, the youngest son, or one of the next to the youngest son of Isaac. And uh, uh, Isaac loved Joseph, maybe more than the others. But he definitely, you know, showed him favoritism. He bought Joseph this coat of many colors. And what that tells us, the Bible, you know, you, you, again, you have to understand the Bible and, and the phrases and things in there, because sometimes it just come out, doesn't come out and tell us. But what that is telling us by that is it was, it was a very expensive coat. Anything dyed back in that day, especially if it was blue or purple, was very expensive. So he gave Joseph this expensive coat, who Joseph, you know, which Joseph wore proudly, even when he was about with his brothers. And Joseph was given the gift of interpreting dreams by God. And Joseph made the mistake of going out to his brothers, his older brothers now, if any of you have had older brothers or even sisters, you may know there's some things you keep to yourself, probably. There's some things you don't say. But Joseph went to them and he said, Hey guys, you know what? I had a dream. And in this dream, this is what happened. Some sheaves were there and they bowed down. And I know what that means is someday you're going to bow down before me. You say that to an older brother or sister and you're probably going to get it. And so they became angry with Joseph, so angry that some wanted to kill him. But others did not want to kill him, but they said, let's do this, let's sell him. So you know the story, they put, a, put him in a pit, and when a caravan came by, slave traders, they sold Joseph. And he was carried off to Egypt, and there he was a slave. And he became a slave in a man by the name of Potiphar. And he was very a tr uh, trusted servant or slave. And being a young man, Potiphar's wife thought he was nice looking, and she made some advances towards him, and he said, no, I, I can't do this. And so because he refused her, and she was angry and hurt or whatever, and so she accused him of inappropriate behavior. And so you know where he landed up? In prison. 
And Joseph could have thought, God, why? why first, I, my, I was put in a hole by my brothers and sold into slavery, and now I'm in prison, accused of something I didn't even do. God, what, what, what's going on? Well, he was in prison. You may, you, some of you know the story well. He met a couple men who had been put in prison by Pharaoh, or the king of Egypt, because they had offended him. One was a chief baker, one was a cupbearer. And they had dreams, and so he interpreted their dreams. And they made the promise to him that, well, someday if we ever get out of here, we're going to remember you. Well, down the road, the chief baker was killed, and the bear, cup bearer went on back to Pharaoh, and he didn't keep his promise at first. But then Pharaoh had a dream. And finally, he came to the cup bearer, and he goes, you know what, king, you know, Pharaoh, th there's this guy in prison who I met, and he could interpret dreams. So he calls for Joseph. And Joseph correctly interpreted the dreams. He said, what this means, O king, is that there's going to be seven years of, of great harvest, followed by seven years of famine. And so Pharaoh then entrusted Joseph into handling, the uh, bringing in the harvest and keeping it and distributing it so that it would last during the famine. In the meantime, back at home, Isaac and his family, they were experiencing the drought and the famine, and so he sends his sons to Egypt to get the grain. Joseph recognizes his brothers immediately, but they don't recognize Joseph. Joseph was in a position of power, and he could have had them thrown in prison, he could have had them killed, whatever, but he did not do it. You know, if you know the story, well, he kind of played mind games with them at first, and later he revealed who he was, and they were worried. They knew what they deserved, but instead Joseph showed them grace and love and forgiveness. And then later he had Pharaoh's approval to bring them all to Egypt where they would be safe and well-fed and taken care of. Joseph is an example of how things can go wrong and they seem like, how could they get worse? And it, it wasn't a pleasant experience for Joseph, by no means, but yet God used that. And so when bad things happen, you know, we may not understand, it may be difficult, but God often has a plan for our life. And, he, and I do believe He has a plan for each and every one of us in this building. We may not understand it, may not know what it is, but he does. Well, these two teams, the Rams and the Bengals, you know, that they're playing in the Super Bowl tonight. They, they're there, but they got there in different ways. Their paths were different. The Rams had, a, had lately had been experiencing some success. They've had some good seasons and not so good seasons. They've made a playoff some years but they have lost in the playoffs, and one year back in 2018, I think it was, they actually lost in the Super Bowl. Lately, they've been winning some, some games the last couple years. They've had some rising stars, and finally the ownership of the Rams decided if they were going to really win, they need to do something about it. And so they decided to go what's called all-in. I'm not a gambler by any means, but I watch enough TV shows, especially the old westerns, you know, they're playing poker, and they decide to push all the chips in the middle, and they're going all in. They're risking everything. They're thinking, I got a good hand here, and I think it's good enough. The Rams thought, you know, we have a good team, but we need to be better. So they went all in. They, they actually obtained some new players, some players that were, you know, kind of controversial. Obel, Obel uh, Beckham. Uh, you'll hear his name tonight. Jalen Ramsey, you'll hear his name tonight. They were cast off from other teams because they, they were controversial. They didn't get along with the other players, and they caused problems. So the Rams brought them in. They took a risk on that. And, the, you know, and then the, about a year ago, they traded for their quarterback, Matthew Stafford, giving up, I think, three draft picks, two number one draft picks for him. They brought him in. He's played well this year. But they decided, you know, we're going to go all in, really all in. We didn't make more changes. So they brought in this during the season, in fact. They brought in uh, Von Miller. He's a pass rusher. You'll hear his name tonight. You know, they, they brought in uh, 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 another guy, Weddle. Brought him out of retirement. They're really going for it. It's either Super Bowl victory or bust for the Rams tonight. 
But in doing so, they're kind of risking the future. They gave up a lot of assets for the future to win tonight. And that they are expected to win. But then there are the Bengals. You know, uh, the Bengals, they've been called the Bungles before. They've not been very successful. In fact, not that long ago, like two years ago, they only won three games, I think it was. And they weren't expected to be where they are tonight. They made a few changes themselves. They added some players, but, you know, no one expected the Bengals to be in the Super Bowl this year. I'm sure even their fans. This is, and that's why people aren't giving them much of a chance. But they have been playing. They're a bunch of no-name players who've been scratching and fighting and doing what they can. Not literally now, but, you know, they, uh, to, to get where they're at tonight. You know, God, they, the Rams went all in. And I wanted to let you know today that, the, that God has gone all in for you and me. And if you don't believe me, just read John 3.16. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son. That so whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. God went all in for you. He gave everything He could give so that we could have eternal life and life abundantly. And He's just waiting for each and every one of us to say, in response, God, I accept what you did for me. In return, I want to go all in for you. God went all in in another character by the name of Joseph, uh, in name of Abraham. He promised Abraham, you're going to be the father of a great nation. Even though Abraham was well past the years that he would normally have a son, he gave him a son. He says, I want you to be the one I'm going to use to bless. I'm going to bless you, Abraham, so that you, through you, I can bless other people. But then something odd happened. You know, some of you know the story. Later on, when Sarah and Abraham have the son, one day God tells Abraham, I want you to take your son to Isaac, and I want you to go worship. I want you to do a sacrifice. And so Abraham takes the firewood and everything he needs for the sacrifice, but one thing. You remember what that, what that was? The animal, the, 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 the item, the animal that was going to be sacrificed. Well, God told Abraham, I want you to sacrifice your son. Well, think about it just for a moment with me. Think about Abraham. First of all, he's being asked to kill his son. You know, tough thing to be asked about. But go even farther than that. Through whom was Abraham going to be a father of a nation? That son. That son. If he was going to kill him, how would God's promise come true? You talk about not only the anguish of being asked to do something that you could think you could never do, but if he did that, how would God's promise come true? God, what, what are you asking? But you know what Abraham did? He trusted God. He went all in with God. He went as far as having the knife in his hand. And then God said, Abraham, stop. Do not harm him. And do you know what Abraham saw nearby in a thicket? Anybody know or remember? A ram. There was a ram provided by God to be sacrificed by Abraham obeying God and trusting him. God rewarded him. God has gone all in in each and every one of us, and He wants us to go all in with Him, trusting Him to the very end, being willing to give Him everything and everyone in our life. And that's how God blesses us. Well, tonight in the Super Bowl, you know, the Brams and the Bengals, and Louise, here it comes. 
Every year I, I pick a winner. And it's usually with my heart more than with, than with my head. Some of you will get this next statement I'm about to say. Some of you will. I do not have a DeLorean who and, and have been able to go into the future and get a sports almanac that lists all the winners of all the major sporting events. Back to the future, remember? And neither am I a football guru and an expert. In fact, most of the time when I pick a team, they lose more than they win. I go with my heart. Well, tonight, I'm picking the team who are a bunch of nobodies. They don't have the star power. They don't have the big names. They have not gone all in, in a way. Instead, they, they have the love of their fans, though. And the fans have this chant. And Julie, you'll sound familiar to you from the Saints. It's very similar. Who day? Who day? Who day going to beat them Bengals? And that's what the hope the Bengal fans are chanting tonight. Growing up in Yorktown, Indiana, I was about less than two hours away from Cincinnati, and, and I grew up watching the Bengals. I love an underdog, underdog story. And I know the Bengals will have a hard time to win tonight. They're not favored. In fact, here's a, here's a, a key, folks. If you don't know, know, don't know a lot about football, if you're watching the game, see how many times that their quarterback, Joe Burrow, gets sacked or rushed. He needs the time to throw the football. If the Rams are able to sack him or prevent him from throwing the ball well, the Bengals are in big trouble. But if they can protect their quarterback, I think the Bengals have a good chance of upsetting the Rams. And the one reason why is, though, too, one of their new players, a man who they drafted this past year, a kicker out of the University of Florida, his name is Evan McPherson. He goes by the name Fear None McPherson. He's very good as a rookie. And that's why I've entitled my message, Fear None and Go All In. Will you go all in with God? We all have something, some talent, something that God can use. But a lot of times what happens is, we tend to hold on to something. You know how it is. If you, if you go through your stuff, let's say you decide to clean house, not just a normal cleaning, but let's say you, you clean out the attic, you clean out the basement, you clean out the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the closets and whatever, but there's usually something that you hang on to, right? You're not ready to get rid of it. God wants us, when we clean out our lives, He wants us at least to be willing, like Abraham, to give Him all. You have something in your life that if you just give it to God, He can use it. It doesn't matter who we are. It doesn't matter what our names are. It doesn't matter if we are star power or not, like the Rams. God can use the things that the world just ignores. Because our greatest ability, I heard this through, through uh, sports now, folks. Our greatest ability is our availability. You can have all the talent in the world, but if you're not available, what good is it? A coach needs his players on the field or on the floor. God just wants our availability. And if we give him what we have, God can use it for his glory. I'm so glad that God came, uh, came all in for me. That's why I'm, why I'm able to stand here today. He knew me. He knew that I needed him in my life. He knew I needed to be forgiven of my sins. And he did, and that time does not allow for me to tell you the story. I feel and Julie have heard it before, but how God used sports to open my eyes and my mind and my heart to the need that I had in my life. And that's another reason why I use a Super Bowl sermon, because like I said, it might speak to someone. God may speak to someone in a way that would resonate with them, where maybe an other kind of sermon would not. Uh, it's not the closing prayer, but it's okay, Adam, if I pray. Okay, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I personally, I am so glad that you went all in for me. I'm so thankful. I believe with all my heart that even if I was the only one who needed to be forgiven, that Jesus would have come down from heaven and become flesh 
and be crucified, even if it was just for me. I didn't deserve it, and I don't deserve it. You've gone all in. You've given us everything you possibly could give. And you're willing to forgive us. Your grace is unmeasurable. You want to give us life. And in return, you just are looking for us to go all in with you. God, if there is something in any of our lives here this morning, including my own, that we're hanging on to, we haven't been willing to give up. May we take a chance on you trust you like we maybe never have before. We know that someday, even though this life may be difficult, for those who per persevere to the end, who are faithful and obedient, our reward is going to be heaven. Just to see your face, just to hear from you, well done, my good and faithful servant. I ask your blessings upon those who are here today, Lord. Speak to all of our hearts. Let us know what it is you want from us and give us the strength and the courage to step out and follow you wherever that road may take us. I ask this, Lord, in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Pastor Adam, forever. Would you stand with us one more time? You pay
God's grace and peace today. Have a wonderful Sunday.